so. Um, it feels a little bit chillier in here today. I do appreciate that. So, Anna, you can put them over there so it's not inconspicuous. We have brought rugs because, as we said, that we are worried that people might freeze. And if you're too cold, you'll go, oh, I'm not going back there. It's too cold to go to church. So we have got rugs. Um, and Anna's got them spread on her. Look at that. I was going to say she should start modeling them. Get, no, you'd have to get them all out, love. But if you are cold and you need a rug, please just come and get it again. We would love to increase the heating. There are some heaters on the side, but all it's doing is pumping heat up in the top of the building. So, but we are trying our best. Do I carry on just speaking as you squeak at me? Yeah, okay. So we're going to stand and sing a couple of songs to begin with. Um, and then we're going to explain what all the boxes are. Um, and we're going to just share this service together. So, yeah, Father, I thank you that we can come and worship you this morning. I thank you that we can bring our gifts um, of who you have made us, how you have created us. And, Lord, we bring all that we are to you this morning. We bring all that you have made within us. And, Lord, we come and bring it as our worship to you. And, Lord, as we've been listening over the last few weeks about surrendering and dying to you and saying, God, use all that you have made us to be for your world. And, Lord, we also just thank you for different parts of our service already for the gifts of life that we see in these boxes about how they change societies and change people. So, Father, be in all that we do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. And welcome to SJ, our speaker, later on. Thank you for coming. We always look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Um, thank you for bringing your shoebox. We'll hear more about that later. And it's still not too late to do them online. Um, if you're around Wednesday morning, we have a little coffee morning up at Clover Link with some of the neighbours up there. You're welcome to join us 11 o'clock at Clover Link. Early evening worship is this coming Saturday, not last Saturday, as I was trying to tell you. Um, so at half past six at Eden's next Saturday, if you want some early evening worship, do go along. If you are of a creative mind, Anna is in the process of putting up some creative connection dates. So I think, oh, we've got lots of dates coming up. Well, hey, she's on the ball. So lots of dates there. See Anna if you're interested, want to know more about what Creative Connections is all about. Um, if you would like to serve on a Sunday morning, there's opportunity to help put chairs out first thing and put the banners and flags up, perhaps on a rotor once a month if you want to get involved in that. Please see me or Esther and we'll kind of get a rotor up for that to help with chairs and banners or anything else you want to get involved with. Maybe you'd like to do refreshments or come up here and speak or something, I don't know. Sing, dance, whatever. Thank you. Morning, family. So last Sunday, uh, much to the surprise of a number of our leadership team, uh, I said that we would report on how we got on with interviewing Vicky. And after an intensive time, um, we had to renew certain spotlights as they broke <laughs> under the pressure. Um, we had a great morning on Friday, a uh, really positive time sharing together and listening to one another. And the end result was that I'm really sorry to have to tell you. Oh, no, I'm really glad to be able to tell you that um, overwhelmingly we are offering to Vicky um, a, a two-day week community support worker position here in this church. Thanks be to God. You might want to just say thank you to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the commissioning time will be on Sunday the 1st of December. What a nice Christmas present to head into uh, that season. And uh, the start date will be Tuesday the 3rd of December. So that's what we're working on. Um, and please put lots of your prayers together for those situations. And of course, then for onwards from that date on. Vicky's really excited. She's so excited that this afternoon she's heading off, leaving us all stranded here while she goes off and meets with God uh, for a time of retreat. What a great way to start. So thank you for your prayers for the interview on Friday. God bless you. I don't know about you, but I want to mess up these boxes because they are too, the symmetry of this is too much. I feel we need to change them a little bit. So we are going to do that. But before we do, we've got a little video to watch because these boxes we saw three weeks ago when we shared the video with everybody about what happens to these boxes, where they go. Um, when we were looking at some of the resources, we've got a video, and it's all about actually affecting those with sign language and deaf communities overseas. So actually, not just because we've got June, and that's part of June's real heart to help with the deaf community, but it just, again, and I found it really quite emotional to watch. So we're just gonna watch this video, and then I'm gonna explain what we're gonna do with the boxes and how we're gonna pray into the situations. So, tech guys. Over to you. So I took them in for them to be educated like other kids. 
it's the love. It's a pure love from my heart. When you have that love and you see them being abused because of their hard of hearing, sometimes the parents do not understand. They don't see as these kids are like other kids. So that's why I have that patient to take them in. They are all the same. They are all equal. They should know. them to know that Jesus loved them and for them to know God deeper for them to spread the gospel to others I started here today with the shoe boxes In that, where it said down the bottom corner, I realized that people loved me. And I watched that yesterday, and I was, you know, no tissues near the desk, so I'm having to use my sleeve because it just breaks your heart when you see that people don't know that they are loved. And that's overseas, but we also know that around here. So this is not just a message for all these shoeboxes, it's a message for everywhere that we're trying to, as a church, as Christians, share that wonderful story that God loves them. And there's something powerful as you're watching that video in the silence without words. There is something so powerful because it really does sit with you. It sits deep and it sits like that is the joy and the amazement of a shoebox. It changes a life. And when you pack this, you may not believe that it changes a life. But that video just shows us time and time again how shoeboxes change people's lives. So what we are going to do is I would like you... I know there's more, less shoeboxes than around people, but I would like you to come and move from your seats. I know moving in a church, sorry, but it's good for the heat and uh, moving around. Um, um, come and grab a box. If it's one between two, grab a box, and we're going to just pray for these boxes. So I'm going to let you come up, grab yourself a box. I'm going to take this one to my friend over here, but come grab yourself a box, and we're going to explain to you how we're going to pray. That's uh, Stu's got rid of that box. Okay.
So thank you very much. So one of the things they share and say at the beginning when we do these boxes is that we are praying for the child that this box goes to. And this could go to anywhere in the world. This can go to any sort of um, place, any child. We don't know. But this is where we're just praying that God's love would be poured out on that child. And it's a simple prayer, but it's an amazing prayer, as we saw in that story. So I'm saying, let us do that. Take a moment. You can do it in your head. Sorry, Anna's whispering to me, and I can't hear what she's saying. Yes. And there's many online, that those that are more online-based, like that. So I will do that. But you pray for your boxes. We can spend time. If you want to do this in your head, pray in your head. If you want to pray out loud, pray out loud, whatever you are comfortable with. But we just want to pray God's love over these, fa- these children that are going to receive these boxes. So off you go. Father, I thank you that you change lives. Father, I thank you that in a, what seems like a simple shoebox, you can bring about your love. And Lord, we pray for these boxes here as they go on their journey around the world, as they go to different places. We pray for the ones that have been done online. We pray for those, Lord, as well, that they will just meet the right people with the right gifts. Lord, just seeing that lad bouncing the ball and then sometimes thinking, is a ball really a good present or the hat? And you wonder whether it's the right gift. But Lord, I thank you that you position these boxes with the right children for the things that they need, the things that will bring them joy, the things that will bring them hope and bring the opportunity of new life. So we thank you, Lord, for these boxes and the journey that they can go on. And we just pray your protection over them, that they will get to the children that they need to. We pray for the whole process as teams meet in sorting places over the next few weeks to get them prepared to go overseas. We pray for that, exp- that time as well. That, Lord, it will just be just a moment of just seeing again your faith, your glory worked out in these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you would like to, you can come and bring your box back and stack them in whatever position you would like. You don't have to make a pyramid. There may be some people in church that might get up and put them back in a pyramid. But I'm happy for you to place them wherever you like. Um, Just there. And if you would like to help at the end of the service, taking them to Austin's car, um, that I'm, I'm sure Austin would really appreciate your manual labor as you move them back. Thank you very much. Oh, that's beautiful. But we are going to move through to a song, and the next is going to speak. The youth, children, young people are able to go as they like. Leaders, um, Anna's doing kids. Youth is Jude. So, and there is Croatia this morning. So, yeah, as we sing the song, you can go out as you like throughout the song. You want to go first or last? Up to you. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Okay, just to clarify for my sister-in-law and my wife, um, that the, everybody's leaving once I finish this song. Is that correct? Am I getting nods of affirmation? sing Amazing Grace, um, My Chains Are Gone, um, and we are aware there are so many different versions, so we need, feel like we need to do a little intro to explain why it might not be the rhythm you're used to, but Lou and I have spent many times listening to about 10 different versions, so <laughs> you might even get all 10 versions in this song, because um, <laughs> it is one of those songs, so your grace and your patience with us as we sing this song, we already are receiving, so yes, let's stand.
Some of you do not know SJ, some of you will, so I encourage you to read SJ. She's done a really interesting thesis, she's finished writing, and I'm sure you would love to find out more about it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, okay. <laughs> but let's just pray for SJ. Father, I thank you for this topic of revolution and changing the way we see church, changing the way we see things in line with how you model before us. And Lord, I pray for SJ and, and all the teaching, all the prep she's done, that Lord, you will just guide her words, guide her thoughts, guide her communication to us. And Lord, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear what you are saying to us individually, but also as a church, Lord, as we see this unpacked before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everyone not going when you said everyone could leave. I'm really glad that some people stayed, so thank you for that. Um, it's really great to be with you again. I'm very sorry to say that I already have dates booked to come back here in 2025, so it doesn't matter how bad I am this morning. Um, but we're continuing your series on the marks of a true Christian. So exploring the things that make church different, um, how we as Christians have been challenged to act differently to the rest of the world that's around us, um, how we can be different as community. Um, and so this morning we're looking at this idea of healthy community. So we'll start by reading some of the passage that I was given. Uh, so we're in Romans chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 9. The verses will come up on the screen um, and they are from Tom Wright's version uh, if you are interested. So it says, love must be real. Hate what is evil, stick fast to what is good. Be truly affectionate in showing love one for another. Compete with each other in giving mutual respect. Don't get tired of working hard. Be on fire with the spirit. Work as slaves for the Lord. Celebrate your hope. Be patient in suffering. Give constant energy to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people. Make sure you are hospitable to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them, don't curse them. Celebrate with those who are celebrating. Mourn with mourners. Come to the same mind with one another. Don't give yourselves airs, but associate with the humble. Don't get too clever for yourselves. Never repay anyone evil for evil. Think through what will seem good to everyone that's watching. If it's possible, as far as you can, live at peace with all people. Don't take revenge, my dear people, but allow God's anger room to work. The Bible says, after all, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. If you do this, you'll pile up burning coals on his head. Don't let evil conquer you. Rather, conquer evil with good. So we're now going to explore each point in turn before we turn to Acts chapters 2 to 4, which was the rest of the... No, I'm joking. Um, so the passage that we've just read is obviously a series in itself. If you take each one of those ideas in turn and really study it and dig into it, and work out how we apply that to our lives as individuals and as a group. Um, but I'm going to leave you to do that in your own time, but I wonder whether there was something in that that really stuck out to you. And somehow I found, reading it in a different version, there were things in there that I was like, wow, wow, I don't know that I really live like that. I don't know if there was something in there that you thought you could have done more with this week, whether you found it tough to live out your life this week. Maybe there was someone who this week has competed with you, maybe in a meeting, um, and what you got was the very opposite of mutual respect. But perhaps that ended up with you being drawn in a little bit further than you wanted to, and you ended up bad-mouthing that person to another friend or colleague. I know I've done that just in the last couple of days. Have you had a week where love wasn't actually very real? Have you had a moment when you lost your patience with someone, or where you got tired of working hard, was there someone in your world that 
honoured themselves above other people or even above you. It's been half term, so I think some people might not have lived at peace with everybody. It's just a hunch, <laughs> but maybe. Um, and I think we all find that we feel that love is this feeling that comes and goes, but this passage implies that love isn't just about how we feel, but it's deeply connected to how we work with and help and are connected to other people. How we help people physically or emotionally or spiritually or how we're hospitable to other people. Contributing financially, giving constant energy to prayer. These are all, Paul says here, these are all ways to demonstrate love. And the problem is that this isn't just a message for your church leaders, it's a message for all of us. We're all expected to do all of these things in this passage. And I think that is really countercultural. Living like this is against the way of a lot of the world. So if we're going to learn how to be a healthy community, and if we're going to live together as a healthy, healthy community, we have to learn how to be a community. And that is about how we learn to do church together. The, those chapters in Acts talk about how they're learning to be church, learning how to do church, learning how to live with each other. And our role in society should spring out of our lives as a healthy church community. Because I think we're really living at a time which needs the church to show these things that we've just read through. The world needs a church like this. I need a church like this. We all need a church where people are really committed to God and to each other and to the communities we live in. And that, I think, is healthy community. Because like it or not, we all really need community. Loneliness is a massive problem. We had in the UK the world's first minister for loneliness. Half a million older adults in the UK say they go at least five or six days a week without seeing or speaking to anyone. Half a million people, older people, go five or six days a week without seeing or speaking to anyone. Over 9 million adults in this country say they are always or often lonely. That's more than the population of London. They're always or often lonely. In an Action for Children survey, 24% of parents said they were always or often lonely. Nearly one in four parents say they're always or often lonely. It's a huge problem. We need community. So um, there was this viral clip that went, uh, was on social media, and this is an actor from a 90s TV show called Blues Clues, if you're as clueless as I was. Um, Hello. And all he does is listen for one minute. What's new? This has had millions and millions of views, this. Thousands of people commented on this, sharing things that they wanted someone else to hear. And all he does is listen for a minute. of people wanted to watch that to feel listened to and it reminded me of this quote being heard is so close to being loved that the, for the average person they're almost indistinguishable it's by Christian author David Augsburger people are desperate to be heard people are desperate for community and the community that comes from being truly listened to I really think if there's one thing you're going to go and do after this it's go and listen to someone like, just go and listen to someone. Don't give them all of your answers. Just truly listen to someone else. I genuinely think that's a huge way we can make a difference in our workplaces, in our communities, in our families, in our friendship groups. And Christians, we would hope that church would be a, a place where we can find that healthy community. 
Church should be a space where we feel accepted and loved and honoured for who we are, not just for what we bring. But church can be really tough, and it can be among the most unhealthy communities. And I know that sometimes I really struggle with church. I often joke that Jesus left before church started, and maybe he was on to something. But I don't think that's the attitude I'm supposed to have. Um, But if the community that I'm part of isn't healthy, maybe I'm part of the problem. And my relationship with church is complicated. I've been part of several different churches. Not that I make that sound like I've been booted out or that I've just walked. I haven't. It's just that I'm quite old and um, I was brought up in church. So, you know, I've been part of different churches. And I've definitely been part of some amazing and incredible churches communities. I remember when I was at university, um, and the church I went to was quite small. We only had a very few Christians in it, a very few students in it. it was everyone was lots of people Christians. <laughs> but um, every Sunday for three years, when I was a student, I was fed on for Sunday lunch, except for two weeks when I was asked out for lunch, but I couldn't go because I had other things on. Um, but we were fed, and that wasn't just the students. Loads of people were fed in that church. It was really hospitable. We were next door to a student accommodation, um, and one week very early in term time. By the way, this is before mobile phones. Um, it was very early in term, and one of the students from the, the accommodation came to church. So I think we started at like 10 o'clock, and then someone invited us out for lunch, so we all went for lunch. And then we stayed at their house for tea, then we went back for the evening service, and there was an older couple in the church who used to invite everybody after the evening service for tea and toast back at their house. So this student had left her flat at 10 a.m., and she got back at 10 p.m., and her flatmates were pacing up and down, like, where have you been? Which I thought, I went to church. It was 12 hours ago you went to church. What have you been doing? She said, well, I, I, I went for, for lunch. You went for lunch? But that was, you know, it still doesn't, why are you back at 10 o'clock? Well, we, we went back to church for another, another service. Was it till 10 o'clock? No, we had tea and toast at someone else's house. Do you know these people? No. <laughs> and they just couldn't understand it. But we just, that was what we did every Sunday was I, you know, was out all day and I was fed really, really well. And for me, I loved being part of that community. I loved being part of people's families and deepening those relationships at a time when I think many young people feel a bit lost. Um, And I am convinced that that experience was fundamental to my faith at that point in time. But time in church has not always been that good. And it has on occasions been painful and difficult. And there are some things that people at church have done or not let me do um, that have left deep scars with me. And sometimes they were things people do now remind me of deep hurts that people have done in the past. And you might be an old hand at church. You might have spent decades coming along to church uh, and you've grown up in it. And maybe you see being part of this community as an integral part of who you are. Maybe you love being here and you're, or you love being in church in general. You love being part of the community and you can't imagine there are any problems. I hope that you knowing that other people feel differently might help you to understand what people are going through or why they might come late or why they might leave without talking to anybody. But you know that you can make a difference in the way that you accept and love people that come into your community. Maybe you've also one of those people that's experienced hurt and pain because of things that have happened in church or people in church. Perhaps it's for things that didn't happen, the time you were ill or no one, and no one called, when you just needed someone like this to listen. And all you received was, oh, here's John 3.16, or here's a Bible verse for you. And just what you wanted was someone to sit and cry with you or to just listen without judgment. And maybe you don't feel healed of all that. Thank you for coming anyway to listen to me. And thank you for being committed to being part of this community. Thanks for being prepared to give church another try. I don't have all of the answers. Um, I'm not the perfect church member. A long way off. And I know that I can say all these things and I'm not even a member of your church. But I do feel like part of your community, whether you like it or not. (laughs) But the passage that we looked at in this morning and those chapters and acts are just full of love. 
I hope that was something that you really heard in those passages, was love, love for God, love for Jesus, love for each other, love for the world. And I think a community like that would be really healthy. So our faith is personal. Our faith is our own. Our relationship with God comes to us as individuals, but we are not called to be individualistic. So our faith is individual, but it's not that we are more interested in ourself than the community. Together, we remember what God's done for us through things like communion. That's something that we do as a community. And I think sometimes we fall into the trap of saying, oh, well, I think church should be more like this, or I think church should be more like that. And we forget that we are the church. And if we want things to happen, then maybe we have to start being the change. Do you want church to be friendlier? Maybe you have to start being a better friend to people. Do you want the church to have more emphasis on prayer, on giving? Maybe you need to start something up and see who else joins. Christian writer and speaker Krish Kandaya wrote an article a few years ago called Church is a Family, Not an Event. And he talks, out, talks about in that article how he point out about how we say we go to church more than we talk about being the church. And he says that he worries that this might lead us to think that church is mostly an event that Christians attend rather than something that we are. And in this article, he goes on to say that he absolutely believes that we should have Bible teaching and communion and prayer, that they're really fundamental parts of church life. He compares it to a family and says that things like school plays and graduation ceremonies are important in families. But he says, if I were to define parenting as only remembering to turn up for and photograph my child's sports day, piano recital, birthday party, you'd probably argue I had a limited understanding of parenting. And he talks in this article about what a family unit at that point in time meant, saying that, the, this, that families would be cross-generational, lots of generations all together, and it would include other people in your household, like your in-laws, like enslaved people, like guests who are with you. They were all part of your household. And at that point in time, church for those Christians wasn't just an event. It was a healthy community. It was a place and a way that they should, could show care and compassion for people on the edge of society, to bring them in, to care for some of the most vulnerable, like we saw in that video. And that was through the model of family. But one of the commentaries I read said that the problem is that community involves two-way commitment. Community is wonderful, but it's also really hard and is really demanding of us. It asks us to open ourselves up, to be vulnerable, to carry each other's burdens. I think sometimes it's easier to be attracted to the idea of community than it is to actually be attracted to really living in community. What would it be like if you brought your honest self here? What are you worried about if you don't bring your honest, full self here? If our healthy church community is more like a family than an event, how can we make that happen so that people can bring themselves here, bring all of them? So I've got some illustrations, and um, none of them is exactly right, which is the point of illustrations, um, and maybe none of them will stick with you, but I just thought it was useful to kind of think through some ideas. We've had this picture of a healthy community being a family and not just an event. But I wonder if sometimes we think about church as a community as a bit like a restaurant, somewhere that we come along and get fed. And I wonder if actually a healthy community would be more like one of those um, stations, those water stations that you get at marathons, where you get your cup of water, or I've never done a marathon, so I don't know what you get, but um, you know, where you're, but you're, I, I see it on TV, <laughs> but you know, people run past and they grab something and they grab it so that they can carry on running. They get something they can drink deeply from, but it gives them energy to get back on with the race. Maybe church shouldn't just be a waiter that comes and brings you your meal but that you are an important part of what's happening. And the rest of the church, that church community, is not only there giving out the water, but cheering you on, is shouting your name that's written on your vest, yelling you on in an encouraging way to live out your faith. You come here for teaching, for fellowship, for communion, and that helps you to get back out there and to run the race. 
I think sometimes we think that maybe church is a bit like a lifeboat, somewhere that we can crawl into to get out of our problems. And I wonder whether church should be a healthy community, would be more like a support boat for cross-channel swimmers, giving us the things that we need at just the right time, being there, coaching us, communicating with us like how far we've come, maybe showing us how far we still have to go. I think better than a support boat, though, healthy community means also getting in the water and swimming alongside us. I think sometimes we think that church, that community, is a bit like being a rocket, full of energy, moving into new places, doing new and exciting things. But perhaps a healthy community is more like the launch pad and the rocket together. Loads of activity happens on a launch pad. And rockets spend time there, but it's not the aim of that rocket to be on the launch pad. While it's there, it's filled with fuel. It receives checks to make sure that it's ready to fulfill its purpose. It's not the end point for the rocket, but it's the starting point. And that launch pad requires all sorts of different people to make it work. And everyone's got a role. I was looking up some and just a few of the people that are needed to make rockets launch. Medical personnel, engineers, fitness specialists, psychologists, IT people, cleaners, administrators, project managers, launch director, human behavior experts, flight control team, caterers. There are so many different roles that are needed to get a rocket into space. And all it does is put a handful of people up into space for a little while. But everybody has got a point to play there. Ultimately, though, why are we going to bother doing any of this? What's so important about us being part of a, hu a healthy community? I really enjoyed this, this quote from Christian writer Tom Wright. The church, this healthy community, is to be a place where together we learn how to be God's genuinely human beings, worshipping God and serving him by reflecting his image in the world. Healthy community is us. A family, it's not an event. Healthy community helps us to be God's genuine human beings. Healthy community allows us to reflect God into the world. And that's something that I want to be part of. You know, that's something that I need as well. Perhaps there's room for one final image of what I think maybe healthy community should be. And that's a disco ball. A disco ball reflects light but it's made up of lots of pieces of broken glass. And that's what a healthy community is. Lots of broken people coming together to reflect God's image back into the world. So I don't know what a healthy community looks like to you. Maybe it's that marathon water station. Maybe it's the support boat. Maybe it's that rocket launch pad. Or maybe it looks like a disco ball but may we learn together how to be God's genuinely human beings, worshipping God, serving him, and reflect his image back into the world. I don't know if you want to put that picture back up, Josh, with the ball. We just have a moment just to focus on that and just to see what God is saying to you um, through what SJ shared. Um, so yeah, just want to spend a moment. Maybe you want to look at the image or close your eyes and think about it. But it's that thing of asking God, what do you want me to be in this? Because I love how SJ did it. And there was a few different ways that we input and be part of the community. You're not called to be all of those things. It's finding your way of being you in our community, in our family. So yeah, just spend a moment. Close your eyes if you need to. If you want to just focus on that image. But I would encourage, I would encourage you to ask God, what is it you want me to be?
story. The church does get it wrong. And we have to be real about this. It does hurt people as much as we wish it didn't. It does hurt. And people may have hurt you in church. People may have spoken words over you which aren't true. But they're still words that have been spoken. And you might have held some of those words for you know, many years for some of us. We're older Christians in this room. But the picture was about God restoring and through his water being flowed over us, bringing newness of life into that as well. Um, and I would just like, as we sing the song before communion, just to let ask God if that's you, that you let that minister, that you let that f- refreshing water that he gives you into these situations. So we're going to sing, thank you for saving me. If you want to stand and sing, if you just want to sit and let God minister that to you. But it is about letting his spirit slowly just open the door on some of those things and let him speak his words over you, not some of those words that have hurt you.
how you can order. <laughs> I was held the other day by reading the first few verses in Hebrews, and it says, God has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Great, isn't it? To know someone like that. And we've been praising him this morning. But then it goes on and it says, when he had made purification of sins. What was that in there for? And then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When he had made purification of sins. I believe that speaks of his humility, doesn't it? His coming here to earth. When he took on and went along a way where there was pain and suffering and loneliness. As we've been already hearing this morning. <clears throat> and it is there when we go to the Garden of Eden. Or Gethsemane, sorry. And we see Jesus in agony. Praying fervently. And sweat became, as it were, like drops of blood falling down on the ground. This is a way where we see something of the blood of Jesus Christ. We think of it as being there on the cross, poured out for us. But I feel the start of everything is here, in that Garden of Gethsemane, in a very extreme condition and situation and feeling of the Lord Jesus Christ, how is he who was there praying? We know that there are special situations when perhaps one is under stress or uh, a work, heavy workload or so on. One can sweat drops of blood through their pores in the skin on very extreme occasions. And Jesus finally said in his prayer to his father, your will be done. He was willing to satisfy the Father in all things, paying the price for the sin of humanity, overcoming the sting of death, and obtaining victory over Satan. But where were the disciples? <laughs> they were in slumberland. They had left Jesus alone. And alone he was praying. And these disciples deserted him. And he was then, later on we read that Jesus was arrested and taken to those courts to be on trial. And the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. Can you see what's happening? The pain, the suffering and the loneliness even beginning to grow worse and worse. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, prophesy, who is the one who hit you? Then from Pilate they went unto Herod, and the chief priests and the scribes were standing there, accusing him strongly. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, Again, what do we see? We see the blood flowing, his body in pain, suffering and hurt. And then the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. Robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and give him slaps in the face. And then he was given charge to the Roman soldiers who kept beating him, beating his head with a reed. 
and spitting on him and kneeling down and before him. They mocked him and then they took a purple robe and put it on him and they led him away to crucify him. Jesus stood alone. The nation despised him. Then as we see him going out to Calvary or Golgotha, we see that being who was exhausted, trying to carry the weight of the cross and his battered body and the loss of blood as he walked and struggled, suffered, and was bleeding still. And they say that they even had to just find a person to carry his cross for him. He was so weak at that point of time. And it says when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him with criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Suffering, yes. Nails in his hands and his feet brought forth more blood, more suffering, more pain. He was thirsty. He lost lots of liquid over those six hours. And finally a spear was placed in his side and out came blood and water. He had died a normal death in pain. Uh, on that cross of Calvary. His fight had been against the enemy, sin itself, and the sting of death. And finally he cries, Father, why have you forsaken me? His father had turned away, so we understand, because he was at that point carrying our load of sin sin of each one of us, the sin of the world. Jesus died alone. He not only prayed alone, stood alone, but he died alone. And we've been hearing about loneliness this morning. And we just think of the Savior as God turned away from him. And this morning as we come here, and we look at this bread and we look at the cup, these are to remind us of the one who was willing to go to that cross. And as it we read at the beginning, he made purification of sins. And when we receive that, when we trust in Jesus Christ and say thank you for that, we know that we are purified. We're ready. We take the first step, as it were, <laughs> on our Christian lives. And today we come again, and we just want to say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Amen? Amen. Let's just pray and give thanks. Father, we just thank you this morning because your son was willing to obey everything that you wanted him to do. And as we come this morning, we just look at our Savior and again just say thank you. Thank you for dying for me, for going through that pain, loneliness, suffering, and just being treated in the way that you were treated because of the sin of each one of us. Father, we praise you for the body of Jesus Christ that we see represented in this bread here this morning and we're going to break it and share it and we, Lord we just pray that we may just be able to praise and thank you and for the cup too which reminds us of that shed blood of Jesus Christ poured out for us Father we want to thank you too from the depths of our heart Amen
so much. Lovely to have you with us. Take your seats, teas, coffees, as always. If you want to have anybody to pray or speak about anything to share to do, please do grab Stu or myself or Matt. would love to spend some time with you. But thank you very much and have a wonderful